All right, I think I'm going to get started. I see a few people are joining us and they can continue to do so. Um, so welcome and thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation on systemic racism, equity and health education as part of our health equity webinar series. Uh, we're so glad that you chose to join us today for this important discussion. The Division of Social Inability in the College of Medicine respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We work in partnership with communities and teach and learn on Treaty 2, Treaty 4, Treaty 5, Treaty 6, Treaty 8, and Treaty 10 territories. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We acknowledge ind Indigenous peoples as ongoing and current stewards of this land. And wherever you may be joining us from, please do your own silent acknowledgement of the traditional people who inhabit the territory where you live. My name is Erin Wolfson, and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist in the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. And today's conversation is part of an ongoing health equity webinar series that we've been hosting for several years now and that we moved online in the spring of last year with the aim of deepening understanding and capacity in health and social equity issues, anti-oppression education and practices, and community engagement. Moving forward, we will continue our work in creating space for dialogue, learning, and engagement around the concept of equity as a framework to look critically at disparities in health and to convey that social accountability is not something that is abstract or aspirational, but it is concrete, measurable, and that if we do not change the practices, we will not change the outcomes. Today's conversation on systemic racism, equity, and health education is not the first nor the last of our conversations on these important topics. Before we begin and go deep into these critical concepts, I'd like to recognize my colleague, Joanna Winichak, who is providing much of the administrative support for this webinar, and for the College of Medicine's IT department for their ongoing support throughout this webinar series. A quick administrative note, we will have time for questions and answers following Manuela's presentation. And uh, if you're not familiar with WebEx, you can find the chat function, uh, I think, on the bottom of your screen, at least it is on mine. So we will encourage you to use the chat to share any questions or comments that come up for you throughout the presentation. So now I'd like to pass it over to our distinguished host of today's conversation. As many of you know, Dr. Manuela Valle Castro has recently taken up a new position as the director of the Division of Social Accountability in the College of Medicine. And you would have seen Manuela's bio in the registration for today's webinar, though I will attach it in the link in case you might have missed it. And just want to say thank you so much, Manuela, for leading this important conversation, and I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you, Joanna. Um, I want to acknowledge the whole team of the Division of Social Accountability who have uh, uh, welcomed me and uh, really supported me in catching up to this role. Um, as Erin uh, just said, um, uh, I just took on this position and it, it really feels like a really big responsibility. I take this responsibility with a, a very, um, very seriously. And, um, and actually last night I had a really hard time going to sleep because I felt like it was so important for me today to be able to convey what I wanna say in a way that it's kind and yet critical and uh, that it's rooted in my own positionality as a, as a newcomer and a racialized immigrant who also benefits from the settler state and from different uh, ways of proximity to whiteness. And I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in my presentation. Um, I just wanna start by acknowledging my my centers, like I call them, my, my mentors, uh, Dr. Verna St. Danis, uh, Sheila McLean, Becky Sasekamus Kufner, and my colleague Sharissa Hanke. Uh, I I work with all of them, and I've learned a lot on this journey of um, being an educator, an advocate, and a researcher, and an evaluator in equity issues, and using anti-racism as a framework to talk about equity. I also want to acknowledge um, the work that Sanya has been doing and the anti-racism think tank out of um, the West Coast in unceded Coast Salish territory, uh, as well as uh, the work of the Brian Sinclair Working Group uh, out of Manitoba. 
uh, the work of uh, Dr. Brenda Gunn and Dr. Alika Lafontaine from uh, University of Manitoba and University of Alberta, res uh, respectively, um, because there is a lot of people that are are looking critically at our health systems and health education in relation to systemic racism. And um, what I'm going to talk about today, it's inspired on, on the work of many of, of, of those. Um, I don't come from the medical profession, but I am a trained researcher and evaluator in uh, interdisciplinary um, data. I know how to read data and, and uh, things like that, but I, I'm supporting my presentation on evidence that has been produced by medical experts. At the same time, I don't pretend to have all the answers going uh, just a month into my new position, but this is really an invitation to an ongoing uh, conversation that I hope it's interdisciplinary and, and inter, it's across all the different silos of the college about how do we go about creating equitable health outcomes for all. That's what's at the at the bottom of our conversation, right? Or that's the that's the horizon of our conversation, right? How do we create equitable health outcomes for all, and how can medical education be uh, part of that. So I'm gonna start by just showing you a picture. And I imagine that many of you are familiar with the person in the picture. Uh, this is Mr. Brian Sinclair. You may have uh, learned about what happened to him. If you haven't, I'm gonna tell you just really briefly that Mr. Sinclair was 45 years old when he died in the emergency room of the Winnipeg's Health Science Center in 2008 from complications of a treatable bladder infection. He had sought care from a family physician who referred him to the HSC, where he died after 34 hours of being systematically ignored, unattended, and uncared for. Um, the following inquest, uh, years after his passing, really failed to address how issues of systemic racism, social exclusion, uh, racial stereotyping, and ableism had played a role in Mr. Sinclair's death. So as a response, a group of, a group of Indigenous leaders, advocates, experts, and academics uh, came together as the Brian Sinclair Working Group out of the University of Manitoba and also some people from the West Coast uh, to produce an alternative report that analyzed and traced how systemic racism played a role on the death of Mr. Uh, Sinclair. You may be familiar with this um, preliminary report. If you haven't, I invite you to see it. It's called Out of Sight and you can access it online. And uh, of course, you may be more familiar with uh, the recent case of Joyce Echaquan, who was uh, an indigenous woman uh, and mother of seven, who earlier this year went into a hospital in Quebec seeking care. Instead, she was met with dehumanizing anti-indigenous racism and got to document her last moments while being taught, taunted and, and neglected. So what Brian Sinclair and Joyce Echaquan have in common is that their cases have called attention to the issue of systemic racism in the Canadian health system. Now, I wanted to quote here my mentor, Dr. Vena St. Denis, when she reflects on, uh, you know, we always have to start presenting the evidence, right? And and we have to wonder how much evidence do we need to talk and address systemic racism? And I also wanted to quote um, a Cree elder that Dr. Ali Calafontaine referred to in his presentation lately that said, for those of us who live this reality, the status quo is no longer an option, right? So just to emphasize the urgency of addressing systemic racism, beyond these specific particular cases and um, an understanding what is it that is at stake is not um, 
a few bad apples, right? Like it's uh, we're going to address the narrative of uh, racism as an individual problem, but to really understand where systemic racism, um, how does it operate? How does it function, right? So one of the main barriers to understand systemic racism is that we uh, usually operate with a model that understands racism as an interpersonal or individual attitude or behavior, right? So if racism is an individual behavior, right, a few bad apples, then individual solutions would solve the problem, right? Say just discipline or um, punish the individuals who perpetrated the, the quote unquote incident, right? However, this really misses out on uh, the bigger the bigger picture of what's happening, right? Uh, the other problem is that we have been taught that racism is an intentional thing, right? Whereas research has shown that most of the times uh, racism is not necessarily conscious nor de deliberate. Does it doesn't really depend on good intentions? It's deeply emb embedded in in biases and in um, uh, hierarchies that are very, very deeply embedded in, uh, in, in dominant narratives that, again, we're going to explore. So when, when we're talking about systemic racism, right, we're talking about the ways that these individual behaviors and attitudes are actually normalized, enabled, encouraged, and institutionalized sometimes by organizational structures, discourses, practice, and even the culture of an organization, right? Can normalize, enable, and encourage behaviors, um, individual behaviors that are um, racist. But there's sort of like a difficulty and a resistance, right? We saw most recently in the case of the RCMP, even though they came around, uh, of moving from the model of, of the interpretation of a few bad apples to locating and addressing how harm is being perpetrated at the level of systems, right? And th there's a resistance, you know, regardless of the evidence, of the surmounting evidence that these are not isolated um, incidents, but there's an overall system, right, that it's uh, reproducing. And um, so why do we focus on uh, anti, why do I focus on anti-Indigenous racism uh, in this particular presentation when I talk about uh, equity and health is um, it's important to understand that in, in our context, oh, they all come together. In our context of the prairies, anti-Indigenous racism is the most prevalent form of inst institutionalized racism. We know that because of the outcomes, right? And in particular, uh, we know that uh, in, in injustice, right, the outcomes, there's serious disparities, but also in health, where outcomes of Indigenous people are consistently and dramatically different from non-Indigenous people, right? Now, the problem is that many times these outcomes are framed within a settler colonial myth, right? Um, that blames, right? That sees Indigenous people as the problem, right? Can't forget that one of the foundational ideas um, of Canada is the quote unquote Indian problem, right? Where uh, indigenous people are seen by systems usually as a nuisance or as an obstacle for development, right? In this settler colonial timeline of development, indigenous people are put as, a, as an element of the past and an obstacle to development, as well as a narrative that blames the outcomes of indigenous people on themselves. Right, whether it's because they uh, would have inferior, inferior morals, intelligence, and skills, or bad choices, 
lack or lack of work ethic, right? So a lot of the knowledge that uh, of the theory and the scholarship on anti-racism does come from the U.S., where the uh, the the focus is anti-black racism, but in in the prairies, right? Even though we acknowledge that all black indigenous people of color experience racialization and that has an out uh, an impact on their outcomes, anti-indigenous racism is the most significant problem and obstacle that we have for equitable outcomes. Yeah. So my friend Charissa uh, allowed me to share this image that sort of like allows us to visualize how is it that systemic racism operates, right? And it's kind of like if we're moving away from, uh, say, biological determinism, right, or seeing the outcomes of indigenous people as based on race, right, we need to understand what is it that is determining the outcomes, right? And uh, in this way, this, this visual, right, this visual aid allows us to understand how we can look at the outcomes, right? But if we don't look at the policies and the practices, right? And the discourses that are animating those policies and practices, we are missing out on the whole picture, right? So we need to understand the dynamic relationship and the productive relationship between um, racist discourses, right? Which we obviously have inherited in a settler colonial society, right? We, but um, discourses, language, ideas uh, that permeate policies and practices, right? So if we have discourses of racial inferiority and superiority, for example, discourse of indigenous inferiority, those are going to permeate the, the practice and policies, right? And those are going to determine the outcomes, right? So if we think in terms of health, right, when we're looking at health outcomes, right, of indigenous people, right, but we're not talking about the colonial discourses, the anti-indigenous stereotypes and biases that inform, right, all these practices on this side, right, we are not going to have the whole picture, right? If we don't understand how the health disparities on the left, right, are determined by the inflicted policies and practices on the right that at the same time are informed by colonial discourses, sorry, let me say discourses here, uh, then we can keep interpreting the, the outcomes as, uh, as a confirmation that indigenous people are, for example, inferior or make bad choices about their health, right? Um, so, of course, there's an interplay, right, between economic inequities. We know that economic inequities translate into poor health outcomes. And don't take it from me, who I'm just a, a community psychologist by training, but take it from our top <laughs> doctor in, in Canada, Dr. Teresa Tam, just released the report from Risk to Resilience, in uh, which she very clearly establishes that the main predictor of, of an, anybody's health in Canada is their socioeconomic status, right? So economic inequities, we do know unequivocally that have an impact on the health outcomes. At the same time, we have evidence that there is systemic racism in healthcare, right? Which doesn't mean that people in healthcare are um, 
have bad intentions or are individually racist or bad people, but that they have inherited a series of discourses and practices that uh, are uh, based on racism. That has resulted in many cases in a, a, a systemic substandard of care and unsafe environments for indigenous people in their interactions with healthcare. Of course, you can see that the interaction between poor health outcomes and a substandard of, of care and indigenous people not even feeling safe to go to the hospital, it's a recipe for disaster. Now, medical education and clinical training, of course, doesn't have the ability to necessarily impact these economic inequities directly, right? Even though we do aspire to have, uh, you know, medical professionals who are advocates and leaders in issues of, of, of equitable health, um, there's a limited uh, impact that we can have here. However, right, we do have a huge opportunity, as I see it, in how medical education and clinical training can either normalize deficit discourse and racist narratives of indigenous inferiority, or we can interrupt them, disrupt them, right, and replace them with critical frameworks of equity. Right? Is that the place that we can intervene in these systems? That is uh, a reflection that I wanted to bring. Now, usually what I what I have seen as an educator and advocate uh, working with some institutions and organizations is that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's sort of two misconceptions about how to go about systemic racism. One, is that it, it, if it affects indigenous people the most, it's, it, it is an indigenous problem, quote unquote. That's up to indigenous people to fix it, right? We will create the indigenous commission or the, you know, uh, to fix the racism in the system. Or we will fix racism in the system with adding culture. Now, this is not to say that we don't have to work and listen to indigenous people. Absolutely. The only way we're going to learn about the barriers uh, that create inequitable outcomes is to listening to indigenous people. However, we can't put the burden on the people who is receiving um, the violence of the system and who are uh, not put, a, don't hold societal power right, to make those changes necessarily, right? And, uh, and, in, and our experience is that culture is absolutely important, but doesn't necessarily fix racism. Now, this is the part where I, I, I feel like I sound like, a, like an insurance salesman. Like, what fixes racism? Well, anti-racism is what we can use as a method uh, to achieve equity because uh, anti-racism uh, anti is a method, right, of analysis, and it's also a transformative pedagogy that allows us to address, right, to locate and address systematically the discourses, practices, and policies that reproduce racial inequities that are implicated in those outcomes. Anti-racism understands diversity as an effect of equity, not the other way around. So when we remove the barriers, diversity sort of, I mean, and inclusion is sort of like a, uh, a, a, um, an effect. It's an ongoing and sustained analysis of power, privilege, and oppression, right? Which of course is easier said than done because it's that's hard work. It's transformative based, not information. It's, it's based on individual and collective transformation and shift in frameworks rather than just transmitting information. And it really challenges the idea that we can approach uh, policy and practice with a colorblind approach, right? Like pretending that race is not there. Experience tells us that the more we talk about race openly, the better we can address it. 
uh, it really shifts the critical attention from learning sort of like the other culture and it turns the eyes, the critical reflection into the mainstream culture, uh, the norm, right? And encourages uh, both white settlers and racialized settlers, right, like me, who benefit from uh, colonialism and whiteness. It, it really helps us to have a path to become allies, to become responsible and in, uh, in, in uh, responsible and accountable as allies. And very importantly, anti-racism uses racial equity indicators to determine the progress of our of our plans, right? So the only way we know that we're making progress is if the outcomes are changing. Right? Again, if we don't, if we focus on diversity and inclusion without centering equity, what we usually get is tokenism. Right. Whereas when we focus on removing all the barriers, right, when equitable outcomes is the focus, diversity and inclusion um, sort of follows, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't be intentional about diversity and inclusion uh, at the same time. But anti-racism as, as a body of scholarship, it's important because it provides us with a, a, a language to name and address power dynamics that are rooted in, in racial hierarchies in the same way that uh, you know, feminism gave us a language to name and address power dynamics rooted in gender, right? If we didn't have concepts such as uh, sexual harassment or uh, domestic violence, right? We couldn't name those. Uh, in the same way, critical race theory and anti-racism scholarship gives us uh, a lot of language to name and intervene in those power dynamics that are rooted in racial hierarchy. Now, from what I was, um, from what I've learned about social accountability so far, is that it's very important that, yeah, that <laughs> it's it's one of these things that it seems to be everywhere, and then it, it can be that means that can be nowhere. Right? So it's very important for me that we talk about it as a, as a specific mandate and an, an obligation for medical schools as per the World Health Organization, also an accreditation standard now for our uh, college. Um, it's very concrete, measurable, and it's a core aspect of our mission. So it's not really like a special interest or an optional criteria, or it's not abstract. And it doesn't interfere with, um, our pursuance of excellence and quality, um, the other way around, the only way we're going to achieve quality uh, is actually uh, focusing on equity. Now, uh, I I know that uh, the team, you know, and the the leaders be before me have made some very important strides, right, in incorporating these frameworks of equity in the College of Medicine, and I think that. In my, uh, what I can contribute the most uh, from the expertise that I bring is to actually really push for, uh, as, a, as a first step, to push for anti-racism and anti-oppressive education in all levels of teaching, uh, to collaborate with, uh, uh, you know, all the different actors in the college to, to train, to build capacity in the college, both faculty and staff in understanding what equity framework brings to the table. And uh, this, not just for our mission of the DSA, but also because we have new equity, diversity and inclusion university wide policy that we wanna support the college in uh, being able to, to be in compliance of that policy as well, right? So we wanna be a resource in that way. We really want to focus on, and I know that my 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 colleagues of my staff uh, have made also a great job at building partnerships with the community, and uh, we think that we're we're going to work on actually designing very specific um, mechanisms of community accountability in which our partners can have a more of an input in, in our in the tools that we're using for curriculum uh, and uh, really to build relationships with uh, the more relationships 
as uh, as we can within the college, sort of like breaking this sil siloed nature of the college as much as we can so that we can collaborate. We know that there's barriers to equity to working towards equity in, uh, you know, working in a institution that it's colonial and hierarchical in nature, that people do have resistance to change and there are fragilities about talking about certain issues and their tone policing is a real thing. We deal with the very dominant discourse of individualism and meritocracy that it's an obstacle to equity, right? The, the, the idea that it's just individuals and their skills and no, there's no structures and barriers. Um, and as I mentioned before, color blindness is an approach and the perception that equity competes with quality. So that sort of uh, wraps up what I wanted to present for you. And then I had some questions for, for you in terms of if you are in the College of Medicine and in your position, whatever your position is, if, if I can invite you to locate, to think about where are those instances where you can locate and potentially change harmful discourses, narratives, and practices that reproduce indigenous people as inferior and undeserving of care. Um, within your resources, what are existing and potential opportunities to introduce our College of Medicine community into these frameworks in a sustained and ongoing manner, and this is very important to say it, this, uh, these sort of frameworks are not sort of like a one-off workshop training. It has a lot of pieces and uh, it draws from many different theories and bodies of scholarship for evidence. So it, it really has to be in a sustained and ongoing manner. And finally, what do you need from us? How would you like to see the role of the DSA in supporting your work uh, in, of introducing equity frameworks at all the levels of teaching and, and, and practicing that you're involved in? So this is again my invitation to uh, engage for engaging and I thank you for listening and I hope we can have a little bit of a conversation now. Do we, Erin, uh, are you taking stock of the questions or comments? I am. So, so, so far we haven't heard too much from, from those participating, um, but we know there's many of you here. So this would be a perfect okay. time to, to share with us, you know, things like, you know, in, in response to the questions that Manuela posed to us um, or other, other questions or comments that sort of sparked you throughout the presentation, um, please do share them with either us individually through the chat or uh, to everyone. Um, and while you're doing that, we did have some questions submitted in advance. Maybe Manuela, do you wanna start mm -hmm. there? Um, so I'll just read it out. Our education mm -hmm. system has largely erased the indigenous history. White settlers like me have to accept our identity as treaty people. Yet what is mm -hmm. the best way to help white settlers reflect on how we benefit from colonialism mm -hmm. on a daily basis? Yeah, that's why. Thank you for that question. That's why it's really important that it's in a it's in a very ongoing and sustained manner. Uh, I was just hearing from uh, the um, uh, the University of Manitoba just incorporated, I think, seventy hours of undergraduate anti racism and anti colonial courses that um, that prepares students in a sort of like in a broken down in a staggered way where pieces are sort of like, you know, they're building blocks that uh, that lead you to have that sort of critical reflexivity that you need, right? That it's a mix of emotional intelligence and awareness of and self-awareness and, and having the right frameworks, right? To understand intersectionality, to understand, um, colonial history to understand colonial harms. So another question, thank you for that, Manuela. Another question um, 
We have from Kathy McLean here. Great points. Love the idea of not just topic for a seminar and would love to hear how you feel this could be addressed amongst multiple partners, such as UGME. And I'll just uh, I'll read out the acronyms for those who aren't familiar. Undergraduate medical education, postgraduate medical education, faculty development, continuing med medical education, uh, EDI, et cetera. How do we pull together? How do we all pull together? This is a very good question, right? Because um, as you know, the college has such complexity of having all these levels of di and different environments for education. And that's why it's very important that it, it's, uh, it doesn't get treated as a sort of like a, a, a one off um, element, but sort of as an overarching framework that and uh, and I'm still trying to figure out how we go about that, but I think it's again, it really has to do with building relationships across this. Like I'm I'm working very closely with with EDI, with the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, I uh, I'm, I'm gonna be uh, you know knocking. I have been knocking on everybody's virtual Zoom door doors, right? And uh, really trying to cross-pollinate maybe like this this idea to have it i don't want to say contaminate i want looking for a more positive metaphor maybe like yeah cross-pollinate this this framework in in all the different levels but yeah we need to talk about whether that looks like as a very centralized strategy or it's more of a bottom up or a top down at the same time so i'm very open to have those conversations yeah because honestly, you have the expertise of how the college works and how medical education works. I have, um, you know, the the other piece. So, don't be shy. I can see. Uh, um, who's here joining and this is a really an opportunity for a dialogue and I know it's over over WebEx and virtually it's not always easy but um uh, I wonder even if there's a questions for clarification like was I clear enough about um how I'm understanding systemic racism and what equities and why anti-racism can help us figure out how to get to equity. And, and when I made the, um, the analogy between, um, you know, the, the language that critical race provides us to talk about power dynamics based on race and feminism providing us with a language to address power dynamics based on gender, that it's important that we, um, you know, we are aware of how those are always playing out together. And that's what what the anti-racism training also can uh, help us figure out, which is the intersectionality of these issues. Oh, there's Erin. Um, oh, thank you. I see that. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. My colleague and while I mentioned is other other or other questions that maybe I just don't see all of the questions, but um, thank you, Catherine, for that question. I'm not familiar with all of the anti racism terms. Can you please explain? Yes, and, and of course, I wouldn't expect you to be familiar with all the anti racism terms. I, I just gave you sort of like a, a hint of some of the things that we talk about. So let me, um, you know, a lot of people when they see the word whiteness, they, they feel very threatened because they think we're talking about like white white people, people with light skin. And 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 like so I want to go over <laughs> maybe over some of these terms. When when we talk about whiteness, we're really conceptualizing um a series of, of norms and ideas that have created this social fiction of whiteness, right? Uh, whiteness is a slippery term that some people have, you know, used for themselves, for example, saying white only, right? On, but as we know, the history of who counts as white inside or outside of that is very slippery. 
right? Irish people were not white at some point, Mexicans were maybe sometimes white. Like why does it something more that doesn't, uh, we're not, it's not an attack on people who uh, experience whiteness, right? But it's to separate that construct, that cultural construct of, of respectability and hard work and other things that we assign or not, or assume from people. And we're socialized into that. Um, so, okay. Uh, so tone policing, for example, refers to, to a dynamic in which um, if a racialized person uh, names racism, right? For example, uh, names a harm, names uh, a harm done by uh, uh, policy or some somebody's uh, words. Um, tone policing, it's, uh, it's kind of like dismissing the claim of harm because of the emotional component of the claim, saying you're just angry, right? Uh, this is, um, you're being rude or you're, you're being angry, right? As opposed to paying attention to the uh, content of the claim of harm. So it's something that it's also related with, uh, with whiteness, right? Because whiteness has been constructed as sort of like as a neutral, as a space of neutrality, right? And then um, demonstrating emotion can be seen as a way of not being rational and neutral. Yeah, does that make sense? This is a very bullet pill size definition, but but yeah, you can you can look up some um I wish I had some specific references about tone policing here, but you know what I what I can do is um share on our webinar page after maybe some resources that people could uh, look into that are introductory to this language. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea, Manuela. And I, I was just going to say the same thing about just, I think generally, uh, we have some resources already on our DSA page, but maybe we'll, we'll definitely make an effort to, to make that and attach that to the webinar information. So, um, but just as a quick aside, if there are other questions that come up post this webinar, please do get in contact with us. And we're happy to you know find further resources to to support um, your learning. I have a couple more questions actually. Uh, I don't see them mm -hmm. in the chat, so uh, thank you for my colleagues to share them with me <laughs> via text. Um, one question was, um, can you expand on the concept? This is a very good question. Expand on the concept of equity versus quality. Mm -hmm. Equality, I would assume. So equity versus equality. Oh, okay, yeah. So. Um, yeah, remember how in the 90s we were very invested in equality. <laughs> so, uh, for for a while we thought that we had to focus on equality, right? Which meant uh, offering equal uh, the same opportunities to everybody, right? So for example, uh, say in the College of Medicine, we're gonna say, uh, you know, for a long time women were not allowed to uh, be doctors. But now we have equality because there's an open door for women, right? Equality. The door is open, right? However, having equality didn't necessarily reflect on the outcomes, right? We opened the door for women. We opened the door for people of color. However, the outcomes were still significant, not, not representative, like we didn't have, say, 50% uh, of women in all levels of the college uh, or the medical profession and 20% uh, indigenous people throughout the college we would be a representative of the population. What happened there? That we didn't pay attention to the barriers that people had to get to the door, right? Or to go through the door, right? Some people came with kids, and no childcare. Some people came with food and housing insecurity. Some people came as single parents, right? So 
Equality is the open door. Equity is understanding what are the barriers to enter that door that has been opened, right? Because otherwise, right? Like for a long time, when I was growing up, you know, my, my anti-feminist little friends, childhood friends would say, what do you mean women are, are smart? We don't have nearly as many scientist women or superheroes as we have men, right? The outcome. But it's uh, because even though the door is open, right? We're not paying attention to what, what does it take to get through that door? Does that make sense? I see a few more here. Um, I'm going to read one that was uh, shared with me in the text. The K-12 public education in Saskatchewan, one, centers and normalizes whiteness, teaches meritocracy and individualism that underpins capitalism, and erases the history of impact of colonialism on Indigenous peoples. So the ideas just presented are completely new to the majority of Saskatchewan residents. Yes, it's important to educate the university level, but how do we create partnerships? Um, oh, sorry. How do we create partnerships with elementary and high school so that the content is delivered at much earlier stages in life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we are working with the school systems, right? Because it's the, you're right. That's where we get our first kind of like round of socializing. And uh, if we don't have the critical thinking elements there to understand our history and our present, it can just fit right into the racist narratives that what we're seeing is a result of a deficit. Um, yeah, so I would uh, agree. All right, here we have another one. In my role, I'm finding that leadership thinks this topic is very important, and as an organization, they must become inclusive and culturally responsive of Indigenous peoples and their policies and practices. But in order to do so, we must revise many practices and create new spaces and positions, which cost money. Budgets are tight and grants are available. However, those funds don't last forever and we don't want to do all this work and then it stops because of funds. How do you suggest we overcome the funding constraints and sustain work? That is a really good question. And I think it has everything to do with involving the leadership and committing them in a way that it's very uh, concrete, right? Uh, we are so lucky in this College of Medicine that we have a dean that actually is very interested in equity, diversity, and inclusion, who is uh, sensitive to the, to the topic. I don't know if you have all read, but he he wrote a blog entry about Joey Sachikwan. And, uh, you know, it seems like in the leadership, what, what I've gotten a sense is that there is very much a will to do it. But uh, maybe this is where we need to work together more to to understand what that path looks like in the long term and what are the resources that we need to commit in order to do that. And again, it's it's a really long, it's a long breath task that we have ahead of us, right? But at the end, there's equitable outcomes in health, right? So it's um, definitely something worth going for. I have a question here from uh, Aaron. What are some examples of equity measures we should incorporate into medicine? Mm. Well, I I couldn't pretend to have them like all figured out. I know some equity uh, issues that would affect uh, me, right? As a, for example, I would know that as a single parent, having access to childcare would be a barrier. Right, but well, the way we need to go about equity is that we do have to listen to the groups, to the 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 groups that are not making it, the people that are falling through the cracks, and I mean in particular, we know that our indigenous students have completely different and specific barriers, um, and uh, and that we do have to consider what other uh, intersections. Right, create additional barriers that living in a you know in a, um, in a remote area, uh, being a gender or sexually diverse, um, suffering inter intergenerational trauma. Like 
this is something that we have to learn first, what are the barriers so that we can address those equity measures. But they can look, uh, you know, as creative things, as having peer support systems in place or, um, you know, um, working with the students to create um, opportunities to, to learn from them and what are their barriers, right? Not only financial, but in terms of family responsibilities, family roles, right? We know that many times our, our international students have completely different norms around family responsibilities. Uh, so just sort of like having an awareness and understanding that not everybody comes to the table in the same conditions. Um, and not everybody goes home in the same conditions. We have a question from, from Abby. Um, I'm curious about whether you have recommendations or comments about how to measure progress towards equity. We can't just focus on tokenistic numbers, but identifying targets might also be important for setting smart mm -hmm. How can we balance yeah. the measurable aspects of improvement towards a more equitable, diverse, inclusive, and safe system? Well, here I think where the work of my colleague Erin Walling has been absolutely brilliant in developing very specific rubrics for, for, for metrics for progress. Uh, and we're trying to figure out with the different areas that we're working, right? Uh, what would uh, metrics of, uh, of equity look like in research? What would uh, metrics of admission look like? Right, and and we we are working to produce those specific um, uh, indicators, and uh, so that we can figure out if what we're doing is working, or we need to uh, backtrack and think of doing things differently if they're not working. If we're not, tar you know, getting the outcomes, if we're not getting equitable outcomes, if we're not having twenty percent of our students that graduate be indigenous if we don't have uh, half of our students that graduate be women if we don't have you know um then we know that there's some there, there there's issues with equity if there if the outcomes are not equitable in relation to the communities that we're serving Workplace culture is hard to change as many people are resistant to change and behavioral change is the hardest to achieve. Do you have any successful experiences with transforming workplace culture that creates an environment conducive to anti-racism? Wow, that's a good question. Um, it, is very, it is very hard to change, but I, I mean, just thinking in terms of how much we have uh, changed uh, our work cultures in relation to gender, and say sexual harassment consent um i find that work culture uh, is it's it, it has to be the change has not to be perceived in order to be effective it can be perceived as sort of like as a top down imposition right but it in order to, to be effective, to effectively change a work culture, people have to have buy-in and they have to be invested in this change. They have to want it and value it and feel proud of it, right? And that in involves changing even like the identity of our organizations and institutions, right? If the identity of our organization is based on, say, elitism and, um, you know, ideas of uh, white superiority, then we definitely need to change the identity of our institution and organization so that it's, it doesn't produce harm, right? Because none of us wanna produce harm, but, um, but yeah, I think that in order to, because you're right, there's a lot of resistance to change and people do feel threatened when you're talking about their identity and their culture. And they are right to feel threatened. It's what they know, right? What makes them. And um, and what I find is that uh, with the right uh, experiential learning 
um, opportunities that that create insight, that create re critical reflection, and that allow you to see the value of the change. If that doesn't happen, yeah, then we're gonna have a problem. How about, I think maybe we have time for one more question. Um, we'll see how we can do. I work in Indigenous health policy and programming for First Nations in Ontario. We host an annual training for 50 frontline workers that hold various positions in the community, health educators, social services, medical clerks. How can I include or at least introduce this framework to them? Health transformation is what the province of Ontario is keen on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the thing is that, yeah, we, again, it can be kind of like a, a presentation in a one year opportunity with a, with a very short, like usually you want to try to look for, for engagements that are more sustained. And in that sense, I find that building strategic relationships with uh, with stakeholders and leaders first, right? So that, for example, you can you can say, "I'm interested in, you know, pitching this topic in this conversation," and um, and then creating creating a a plan that is more sustainable. Now, in Ontario, I I I want to say that they do have the Indigenous Cultural Safety Program with Sanyas too, but I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, I would be willing to to chat more about that because I don't think I have the answer of how it plays out in, in Ontario. And again, um, this is the beginning of our conversation. I'm very open, my door, my virtual door is very open in my office to chat with each one of you and to have group conversations on how can I can we better support what you're doing and how we can expand these opportunities to introduce these frameworks and to do it in an ongoing way. Because I think we're going to run out of time pretty soon. I think so as well. And I saw a few other quick questions. Um, we probably won't have time to get to, but one thing just quickly, Manuela, are we able to share your slides with those attending today? Um, there's going to be a recording of this presentation. Perfect. So, so that's where you can obtain them. Perfect. So I'm just going to thank you again, Manuela, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and asking the tough but essential questions of how do we create equitable outcomes for all and how can medical medical education, health education, and uh, clinical training be part of that. Um, like Manuela just said, if you want to see, you know, the link to uh, the recording of this webinar or to see past recordings um, or learn about future sessions, please do visit our website. I also put um, our email um, to the DSA in the chat, so do feel free to connect with us. And if there's something specific to Manuela, we're happy to send that along as well. And um, I also included uh, a link to a survey. We just we really, really appreciate your thoughts and feedback on this conversation. And you know, this will take no more than one to two minutes, we promise, but we really do value, value your feedback and help to inform our future events and conversations. And I uh, just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again to Manuela. And please do enjoy the rest of your Friday and take care of yourselves. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.